Mr. Pye, let me ask you. Um, um, you know, we, we, sometimes we vigorously disagree uh, with our colleagues. Uh, it's clear you vigorously disagree with the majority of, of this panel on, on uh, the so-called open internet rule. Um, and uh, I appreciate you doing it cheerfully, but also forcefully. Uh, and and I, I want you to help us understand the reasons that, that you have given procedurally and substantively under the statute as to why this decision is, um, is violative of requirements and violative of the Communications Act. Senator, thank you for the question. Uh, I could go through all 67 pages, but I will abbreviate it for the sake of uh, the panel and for everyone uh, watching. Uh, in short, there are problems with process and problems with substance. In terms of process, my view is the agency failed to comply with the Administrative, Proce Administrative Procedure Act in terms of giving public fair notice and an opportunity to comment on the proposal that it ultimately adopted. Here is the indisputable truth. The FCC never proposed Title II. It, it adopted a proposal in May of 2014 that was based on Section 706. Through the course of the summer, it was, it was widely reported that Section 706 was the lead proposal. Later, it was reported that some sort of hybrid proposal uh, based on the Mozilla uh, initiative was the lead proposal. Only after the President's announcement on November 10th uh, that Title II was, quote unquote, my plan, and I'm, quote, asking the FCC to implement it, did the FCC suddenly change course. What would need to have been done for the proposal to actually have been made? I would say, and I said this before the President made his announcement when I held the only FCC hearing that allowed people to comment on net, net neutrality down College Station, Texas, my view was that the, whatever the new proposal was, the American people should be allowed to see it and comment on it. We should have a new round of notice and comment. That would avoid the pickle that the agency is now in, that where it's going to have to litigate for a couple of years whether or not there was sufficient APA notice. But there simply wasn't in this case. And I think the best evidence of that is the fact that you saw a lot of speculation in the press once the, uh, we actually got the document on February 5th, well, what's in it? What's not in it? When changes were made uh, in the lead up to February 26th, well, what does it mean that broadband subscriber access service was removed? How does that affect interconnection? None of those details were public and no one knew how to comment on it because they didn't know what was in the plan. Now, with regard to the substance. With respect to substance, I think that both the text of the Communications Act and the FCC's own precedents make it difficult for, if not impossible, I would argue, for Title II to be applied to the broadband industry. I'll just give you one example of that. With respect to mobile broadband, Section 332 explicitly prohibits private mobile service from being classified as a common carrier. Now, to be sure, through the order, if you've had a chance to read it, you'll see all sorts of legal gymnastics in which the FCC cleverly tries to re redefine the public switch network in order to have it apply to the internet, uh, to, to the mobile broadband services. But I don't think a reviewing court uh, is certainly going to see that that passes muster. Similarly, with respect to wireline Title II, I would argue that there are substantial legal hurdles that the agency is going to have to uh, broach in order to, uh, to to make Title II stick. So both for reasons of process and substance, I think there are serious, uh, there's serious litigation risk with this order. Is there any question in your mind that, that this is going to result in years and years of litigation? The best proof is what has happened in the past. This is the FCC's third bite at the apple. The first two times resulted in unsuccessful challenges at the D.C. Circuit. Uh, the first case, which was uh, the Comcast BitTorrent case, took two years for us to resolve. The 2010 Open Internet Order was only resolved by the D.C. Circuit in 2014. So the silver lining to this order is that the communications bar will be busy for quite some time trying to figure out which court uh, to challenge this in, and uh, the courts will have a long time to, to savor its many details. And, and, and in terms of, of um, protecting the flexibility and the ability going forward of this huge uh, engine of the economy, what does this order do? I, I think it's going to have a significant negative impact, and the best example of that is mobile data. You know, the argument has made, been made repeatedly here today that, well, Title II as applied to mobile has been successful because it's been somewhat diluted, but two points to that. Number one, mobile, as my commissioner, as colleague uh, Commissioner O'Reilly pointed out, mobile data has never been a Title II service. But secondly, it strains credulity to argue that the increase in, the tremendous increase in mobile uh, investment has been attributable to Title II application to mobile voice. Obviously, to anyone who's objective looking at this, the 
introduction of the smartphone in 2007 generated an explosion in mobile data usage, which carriers then had to struggle to keep up with. And they did that by investing billions of dollars in spectrum and billions more in wireless infrastructure. And it was because mobile data was lightly regulated as an information service that we saw all this benefit to, to consumers. I would also argue this sort of paradoxical, to me at least, that in January the FCC made a big show about 25 megabits per second being the standard for broadband, but then in February decided that mobile broadband would be subjected to Title II. As my colleague has pointed out, you can't have it both ways. Mobile doesn't count when it comes to this artificially high threshold, but it does count when we want to regulate, uh, regulate it extensively. Thank you very much.